Welcome, everybody. It's good to see everybody out in the middle of the week for our first Wednesday service. We're expecting it to be a great day. I want to start just by making a couple of announcements, remind you about a couple of things. Our Easter egg hunt is coming up here in a couple of weeks, and we need donations of the plastic eggs and small wrap candy to put in those. There will be a basket to drop those off at the Power Kids check-in station. It's like something might be about to blow up or fall apart. I don't know what's going on. But there will be a basket to drop those off at the Power Kids check-in station. So you can you can drop that off Sunday or even to the next Sunday. So let's be thinking about that. It's obviously small group sign-up time. So if you need to be involved or if you need to help somebody else, if you need to be a blessing to somebody else, sometimes the groups aren't just so that we can have friends. Sometimes you may have all the friends you need but somebody may need you to be their friend. So I encourage everybody to sign up for at least one group. You can kind of start on the end. I think it starts, there's, there's groups for men, groups for ladies, there's groups for couples, young marrieds, all the way up to seniors. There's, there's some uh, teaching groups and classes. One group that's new this year that I wanna spotlight and focus on, I'd like for everybody to consider joining, it's our freedom group. This curriculum really is amazing. We are printing off a 200 page book that we're gonna to give to everybody that joins the group. It's 10 lessons. It's gonna be Saturday right after prayer, right at 10, we're gonna have this group. Again, they're called Freedom Groups. The curriculum is from Know God, Find Freedom. This group is the main reason why they call that Find Freedom. You spend nine weeks getting biblical principles put in your life to dig some things out and pour some things out. And then there's, at the end, we just fill that back in with God and, and it's just a powerful curriculum. I want you, I'd, I'd like for all of our leaders that possibly can join this group, be a part of this. We're gonna video it. It's something we're gonna do perpetually into the future. But if you can be a part of our freedom group, I think it'll be awesome. This Sunday is our, is our sacrificial giving day. It's our vision offering for 2024. So let's be praying about that. Be thinking about that. Stand with me right now. Our worship team's coming. It's first Wednesday. Tom Halsman, Hope Lee are gonna be ministering for us in just a moment. But I want us right now at the beginning of this service, those watching online, why don't you just join us? Can we just lift a hand toward heaven? Can we just begin to love Jesus together? Doesn't it feel good? I feel his presence in this place right now. Doesn't it feel good in the middle of the week? just to feel after him. God, touch us. God, draw us closer to you. God, minister in this service. Anoint our worship. Receive our praise. Anoint everything that's said and done this evening. We glorify you. We praise you.
you today. We thank you today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you so much for what you're doing today. I love you, Lord Jesus. I'd like you to do something, if you would. I'd like you to take the hand beside you, if you can, your husband, your wife, your friends. But while you're doing that, I'd like you to take the hand of Jesus. Sometimes we think that we're just alone, <laughs> but we're not. I want you to take the hand of Jesus and I just want you to start talking to him right now. Lord, we thank you today for your kindness. Thank you for meeting us here right now. Your presence is so sweet tonight and I thank you for that. Thank you so much for loving us the way that you do, bringing us through the times that you have brought us through. You are always faithful and you're always good and you're always kind. And Lord God, we look to you today, Jesus, that you just lead us along the way that we would be able to say yes to the things we need to say yes to and no to the things we need to say no to. Lord Jesus, if I'm going to live, I want to live for you. And when I die, I want to die to you. And I want to thank you for that, Lord Jesus, for what you're going to do in giving us the strength and the courage to face each and every day in our lives. You are faithful, Lord God, and we look to you today and we praise you because you are wonderful and you're counselor, you're the mighty God, you're the everlasting Father, and you are the Prince of Peace. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. It is so good to have all of you here. So good to see all of you as much as I can see with the lights in my eyes. And if I took off my glasses, I couldn't see at all anyway, so that's okay. So we're good. And it's good to have all of our friends. And Lindsay, thank you for coming tonight, for, for being here with us and for hope and all like that. Best friend, I know that she probably would have said something, but best friend. The other week, about, what, three weeks, four weeks ago, I was walking through my living room, and as I crossed through a threshold, uh, the Lord seemed to speak to my heart about something, about a title that I didn't even know. I don't think I was even scheduled at that point, but God gave me a, a title, a moment, and hope came over, and we were, she just was talking. We were just talking, and I said, wow that matched exactly what I was thinking and feeling. So we got together and we haven't colluded too much tonight, but the thing about it is, is I want her to be part of this with me, okay? She used to come when I go preaching out, she used to come and people used to think that she was my wife. Wait a minute, she's 16 years old, I'm 30, hello, come on. No, a little bit more than 30, that's 40. Yeah, boy, I'm... <laughs> A little laughter does like a good medicine. Thank the Lord. And as I reflect upon life itself, there have been choices that have made, that I have made that has helped me change my life. Perhaps you've had some choices also. And these choices, whether they are small or large, they have made an impact upon me as well, changing me and making me think a certain way. Now, I remember a choice a long time ago. Now, if any one of you know me, don't ever bring me milk chocolate, right? You already know that. There's no such thing as good milk chocolate, okay? Okay, sorry, I just get that little queasy feeling, okay? Dark chocolate is my go-to. Well, I used to make, by mixture, homemade cakes. And guess what kind of cake I would make? A dark chocolate cake. Dark chocolate with dark chocolate with more dark chocolate. And I remember one last piece. One last piece. And it's sitting on the counter, and I'm looking at it, and I got my fork in my hand, and here comes this little girl bouncing up beside me. And she says, Daddy, 
Daddy, can I have that? And I looked at the cake, and I looked at her, and I looked at the cake, and I looked at her. And I looked at the cake, my favorite number is three, the third time, and I pushed it over to her, and I said, sure, you can have it. It was a tough way to give. <laughs> my last piece to my little girl, the cake, what I loved to my little girl, selfishness or giving. As you all know that I've talked about this before, there's more to life than what you know. That comes from God. In Jude chapter, no, verse 24. Does anybody know how many chapters is in the book of Jude? Very good. There's a lot of people that don't know there's just one chapter in the book of Jude. Very good. You pass with a gold star tonight. In Jude 24 and 25, it says, Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, thank you very much, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty both now and forever. T.F. Tenney's last known words, he was a great minister and loved him dearly, his last known words was, his sustaining presence has kept me. Psalms 3 and 5 tells us this, I laid down and slept, I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. Do you know that we are connected to the one who made the heavens and the earth, and he wants to welcome you into his presence? You've been given his breath, and there are some who have stolen it, to serve themselves and not God. The Bible even tells us that in his presence there is what? Fullness of joy. For when we have been low, he comes in and wraps his arms all around us and tells me, and he tells you it's going to be okay. For his known will instructs us to look up and lift up our heads for your redemption draweth nigh. That is the known will of God for you tonight. Because what I'm talking to you tonight is the power of choice. At that moment, I must make a choice in my life. Psalms 34, 1 and 2 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth and my soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and it will be glad. The known will of God for your life. Or you can choose, as many people do, to roll about and to wallow. To roll about in something even as a pig wallers in the mud in sinful activities. Or if you cry in emotional state, whoa, woe is me. I've done that. And I would venture to say most of us have. <laughs> Woe is me. We may say it one too many times, and you might be accused of wallowing in self-pity. People wallow in sorrows and disparity, which they think is unfairness to them. Sometimes people walk away blaming God for what others have done. I have a question and I've been asking this question not only up in Troy, but anywhere I talk. And even today, I ask a supervisor today at work, I have a question for you. Why are you angry with God? He didn't do it. Trust him even in the bad times, and he will bring you through your sorrows. Perhaps we should choose to make the negative positive, positive in our lives by trusting him at what? All times, you people, pour out your heart before him, for God is our refuge for us. And then it stops this, and it says, Selah. And that is the musical term by saying, pause, take a thought about it. Or you can even think it this way, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. Psalms 118, verse 8, the middle verse of the Bible. 
That's the pivot point of how we should be living, trusting God in all things. The power of choice that you and I have in our lives is a choice to be courageous because courageous does not panic, but it prays. It doesn't bemoan or express discontent or sorrow, but it believes. It listens to the voice of God calling through its word. When I moved back to Ohio, I was in a very broken place. I was grieving the loss of many things. And to be quite honest, I felt like God had forgotten me. My prayers seemed unanswered. There were so many parts of me that wanted to run away, and I think we've all felt that way occasionally. But I had a little boy that needed me. And what I didn't want him to do is I didn't want him to grow up surrounded by anger and bitterness, but I wanted him to see a mother that clung to the food of the cross. And so I resolved two things. First, I would allow God to make something good out of all of it, all the muck, the rejection, the loss, and the failures. And secondly, I would be whole. I would understand what whole looked like, what it felt like, and how to get there. And I would do anything in my power to obtain it. I had a few conversations on the concept of wholeness with several people. And the best advice I was given by my parents was go to the word. And so that's what I did. I researched the word whole, which led to the Greek word sozo. It appears in the New Testament 111 times, and the word means saved, healed, and delivered. It means to preserve, do well, to be, or to make whole. While there are other words that mean saved, others that mean healed, and others that mean delivered, this specific word denotes a complete package of salvation, healing, and deliverance. It's God's picture of wholeness. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. I went to different passages in the Bible, and the first one I came to was the woman with the issue of blood. She had been sick for 12 years. She reached a point of desperation. She'd gone through all her resources, been to every doctor. No one could help her. But she reached a place that she said, I've got to get to Jesus. She'd been living on very little, and the disease that she had would have made her isolated, and I'm sure she felt incredibly alone. But she knew that there was only one place to go, and that was Jesus. And it said that she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. It means that she was crawling on the ground. She was doing whatever she could to get yes. to Jesus. And in Luke 8, he says, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. He called her daughter. It's my understanding she's the only person in the New Testament that he called daughter. He loves us so much that he calls us sons and daughters. The second packet passage I found was the leper. There were 10 lepers. They all lived in a, in a commune away once again from family and friends, unable to love and provide for their family. I'm sure pain was racking his body. There was a loss of status, physical appearance, and relationships. But once again, he had to get to Jesus, and he got as close as he could. And the Bible says that Jesus healed all 10, but this one came back and he was grateful. He fell at his feet and he thanked Jesus and he was made whole. When I read this, I realized one thing. There's a big distinction between being healed and being whole. Yes. I don't wanna walk with a limp. I don't want people to say, oh, you know, that's why she's that way. No, I want when I tell my story for people to look at me and say, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know what you'd been through. God wants, and I, I have felt so strongly for this church, God wants us to be whole. The third passage I came across was the woman with the alabaster box. She pressed through glares, whispers, not caring what people thought or said. She sat at the feet of Jesus. She washed his feet with her tears. She worshiped. It didn't matter who saw her weep. Jesus was all she wanted. She didn't care what people were saying. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks of you. It doesn't. It doesn't matter where you've come from, what we've done, where we've been, who's hurt us, who we've hurt. 
What matters is that we have a God that loves us so much. And in return, it should bring up about something inside of us that wells that says, God, I love you. And I've just got to get to you. And I'm going to be at your feet because you see me. Because this was a God who knew her every hurt, her every sorrow, her every sin, each mistake. And he loved her like no one had ever loved her. And he too looks at her and says, your faith has saved you. It's made you whole. Go in peace. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So living for God is a choice. Wouldn't you say so? Of course it is. I want to ask you a question. Do you know what kindness is? Kindness. Well, that's true. Kindness is love. Kindness is when you give someone your strength. Did you know that? Somebody needs a, a word of kindness. They're feeling down. They're feeling discouraged. And you go and show kindness. And you show, give them a smile. And all of a sudden, you see them smile back at you usually. And you feel them. And they feel a little more comfort. I have a tendency to thank everybody for their smile. After I talk to them, I said, thank you for your smile. It means a lot. Because the thing about it is people... Are, are broken in the day in which we live. And we see people every day broken on the streets, on the floors, in plants, wherever you may be, there are broken people. And so kindness is when you give someone your strength. <laughs> Max Lucado had this to say about the path to peace is paved with prayer. If you're not feeling peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding Perhaps we need to pray a little bit more. Perhaps we need to go deeper a little bit more when it comes to walking with the Lord. If you're angry, you're living in the past. If you're fearful, you're living in the future. But if you want to find the peace of God that he has for you, live today in his presence and let yesterday and tomorrow take thought for itself. That's Bible, by the way. It's Matthew 6 and verse 34, right after 6, verse 33. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought for itself. In Matthew 5, 13, Jesus told us that we are the salt of the earth. I got to ask this question, what does that mean? Do you know that salt enhances flavor, but it also makes one thirsty? We are to enhance the world into the presence of God. Salt flavors, but it also makes people thirsty, thirsty for him. I want you to understand this, and this comes from Dr. Seuss, very highly. I think he's uh, well known, isn't he? He said this, to the world you may be one person, but to one person you may be the world. Have you ever met someone that you felt something was different you felt the peace and you felt the strength like as you were in the presence of God yourself. Folks, we are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hid, but also in the house where a candle is lit, not under a bushel hidden. Everyone we come in contact with in the world or within the church or in our families, we are to enhance their lives. Every one of you, Every one of you, it is my responsibility, not my responsibility, it's my, not my duty, but it's what I want to do is to lift and, 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 and adjust the burdens that you carry. I want to be able to help you, and no doubt we want to enhance each other's lives, but that is where God leads us to, to enhance one another. <laughs> we are to lead them. We are to be what God has intended us to be, his testimony of how good he is. If you're not crucified with Christ, you're not living as God intended you to live. Paul even said it this way, I bear in my body the marks of the dying Lord Jesus. He even told us, if anyone would come after me, let him, what, take up his cross and follow me. We have to get to that place, folks, where we begin to pray, God, not my will, but your will be done. 
Whatever your kingdom is for me, whatever your will and plan for my life is, I surrender everything. I surrender my family. I surrender my job. I surrender my cars. I surrender my home. I surrender my health. I surrender me. Everything. Don't be worried about, oh, what if I do that? What's going to happen? No. God got you. As you seek his kingdom, he's going to provide those things that you have need of before you even ask or think. And the life I now live, Paul said, in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 5.24 says it this way, and they that are Christ has crucified the flesh with the affections thereof. So wholeness comes from three acts. First, it's knowing who he is and a desperation to get to him. It's I may not have the words to speak, but I'm going to get as close as I can. If I can't pray, I'll simply open up his word. I can't tell you how many times the words have not come. And I've opened up to the book of Psalms and I've just simply read. Something will take place when you read out loud the word of God. Yes. I will word, meditate on his word. I will fill my thoughts with what I know about God. I will consciously remind myself of who he is. I don't know about you, but I have a place where I fall apart, and it seems to be my kitchen floor. I don't know why, but it, it is my place. And when I was going through a lot of my grief, there was one in particular day, Grayson was with my parents, and I remember just falling in a heap on the floor, and the sobs just took over. And it was a day I shouted, and I said, God, where are you? I can't feel you. I don't understand, and I don't know why you're not fixing this. And I wish I could say that I felt an angelic host rush in, in the presence of God but the room was still and the floor was cold. And I pulled myself off the floor, but this time I did it differently. Usually I, I have a very suck it up buttercup mentality, but this time I said, okay, God, I don't understand, but I know who you are and I know you're faithful and I know you're my strength and I know you're my joy. And I began to list out who he was to me and something shifted inside of me and I realized and I look back and I think that was the moment that wholeness began to form because God wanted me to recognize who he was. The second act is gratitude. Now we've all, we've all had those moments and I, I looked at each story and I thought if their approach had been a little different, I wonder what would have happened. They could have looked at God and said, where were you 12 years ago? Why did you expose me to that leper? You know, why, why didn't you stop me? Why did you allow me to go through that abuse and, 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 and to go into all those sinful acts? Why didn't you find me sooner? They could have all had that story. And so could we. Everybody in this room has a story. We've all been somewhere. We've all been hurt. We've all been broken. Some of us, we've, we've broken other people. We're hurt. But I tell you what, the distinguishing factor is gratitude. When we begin to shift our thoughts and it's the power of choice, it says, I'm not going to think in a negative way. I'm not going to worry about what the so-and-so is thinking or what that's taking place, but I'm going to keep my mind in a grateful and thankful place. The third aspect is worship. It's not relying on a feeling, but it's pressing through and reminding ourselves that his compassions fail not. It's bringing, once again, remembrance of his times of faithfulness. Worship is our response to the knowledge of who he is in spite of how we feel. There's also a ministry in worship. Saturday morning prayer is my favorite time of the week. And when I'm not here, my whole week is it's just shot. I don't, I, I, I don't like it. I need to be here. But when I first started coming, I was, I was in a place where it was really hard to pray. The words wouldn't come. And I remember I came up and sat down, and Jesse waits, you're always at the front. And I can't tell you, I hadn't been able to get into that prayer, and all of a sudden, something shifted. And I could get into those places I hadn't. And I realized that he had come, and he had opened up the doors to the throne room. When we worship, we just don't open it for ourselves. 
We open it for somebody who's next to us that can't get into those places and they need our help. We're here for each other. That's what the body of Christ is all about. But secondly, how do we allow God to make something good out of our situation? That's our choice. It's the power of choice by allowing him to work in our lives, allowing him to uncover parts of ourselves that need healed, restored, and changed in order to be more like him. My dad has asked me a question my entire life. Every time I've gone to him with an issue or a concern or a hurt, anything, he's asked me one question. And there have been many times I've, I've just not liked him after he's asked it. <laughs> But he's always asked a question, and the question is, what are you learning? And I remember, it's, it's been about a year ago, he asked me that question, and I sat across from him, and I, I began to answer. And I realized as I did that God had been uncovering parts of me that needed to change. You see, sometimes when God wants to get in there and do surgery, he wants to do open heart surgery, and he wants to Show us those things that might be hidden and reveal all things. But we first have to gain control of our minds. Our thoughts control our emotions, not vice versa. Sometimes we think, well, I'm, I feel sad, so that's why I'm thinking this way. No, you have a sad thought, you feel sad. You, you think of all the worst case scenarios, you're going to feel anxious. Paul said in Acts 26.2, I think myself happy. He's talking about the stronghold on the mind, how the enemy can rob you. But Paul made up his mind to be happy and he, he had a rough life. I mean, if he can do it, we can do it. He is in control of how he feels. I don't know about you, but I like to be in control. It is my flaw. It is, it is something I'm working hard at. But if I can say, but I am in control of this, I don't have to hold on to those thoughts that enter my mind. I can choose what I'm going to think. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We have to take those thoughts captive. That means you tell them where to go, what they're going to eat. You starve certain thoughts. You, you feed certain thoughts. You determine what enters in. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We can't depend on our heart. It's deceitful and it's not a reliable source. Feelings and emotions are transient. I'll be honest, if I operated on the way I feel, some days I'd be at an airport with my, my passport and I'd just fly away. Other days I'd be in my chair with a cup of coffee all day. And some days we'd probably all be huddled in a corner, okay? We can't operate on how we feel. We have to be according to the word of God. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is God's promise to us, that if we bring our minds under subjection to his word, this is the choice. It's the power of choice. What we surround ourselves with, is it going to be his love, his faithfulness, and his promises? Because if so, with that comes a confidence and a strength and a peace that surpasses all understanding. So what stops people from making the right choices or experiencing the presence of God or finding the unknown will of God for themselves? Do you know the known will of God? Most people don't understand that. Knowing the will of God and refusing by choosing not to do it is detrimental to your life and God's fulfillment of his plan for you. God's known will is when we are instructed by his word to follow. This is a power of choice, forgiveness, pray, Adjust the load of others. Seeking the kingdom of God first are just some of, and he would tell us, this is the way, walk you in it. For you and for I to apply it to our lives. Choices of following after sexual immorality or impure thoughts 
or idolatry, or jealousies, or outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except in your only little group, envy, drunkenness, worldly parties, and other kinds of sin, and anyone living that sort of life, the Bible says, what will happen to them? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've told this congregation my first question ever out of my mouth when I began to ask a question of the one who took me to church was, how many sins do you have to commit before you go to hell? I don't know if anybody understands this. I know we don't always like to talk about hell, but Jesus talked three times more about hell than he talked about heaven. And this is what we need to understand something. If we're walking with him, We're fulfilling his plan in our lives, and we're saying, God, I want your will in my life. So we read his will. Honestly, when you read the Bible, you're not reading the Bible. He's reading you, and he's showing you exactly what he wants in your life. And this is when we began to look into that mirror and to be changed into his image, because that mirror is his word in our lives and his testimony that he says, I'm going to make something great and perfect out of you. But you got to be willing to follow me, and you got to make that choice in your life to say, yes, Lord, send me. Hmm. The consequences of hate, unforgiveness, lust, love, doubt, faith, joy, those choices we make, Our peace are connected to our choices. Many can quote. How many of you remember Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31? Anybody know that scripture? We quote it quite a bit. It says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Faint means not to lose heart. But does does anybody here have an understanding of what wait means? They that wait upon the Lord. Do you understand that word even in in a picture? I'm going to show you a picture of what waiting means. Oh, yeah, it's letting God have control of your life, but it's being connected to him. We were going to tie our feet to where we could walk our three-legged race, but I guarantee you we'd both probably be on the ground. But here's the point. When God moves... You move with him. When he pauses, you pause. When he turns, you turn. And you connect it to him to where when you are waiting upon God, you're waiting for him to move in your life to make something beautiful out of it. There's a little song, he made something beautiful, he made something good. All my confusion, he understood. What I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. And the reason why is because of the choices that we have made to serve him and not serve the world. Even the Bible tells us this, you cannot love God and the world at the same time. For you, if you love the world, then you become an enemy of God. And that's where we need to be cautious with, to where we love him more today than we did yesterday. And I want to love him. My prayer is this. I want to love you more tomorrow than I did today. I want my heart. You know, the Bible teaches us that we are a sweet-smelling fragrance. Our life is incense. And we toss it on the flame so that we may bring worship and glory to him. Your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. What does it tell us to do with your life then? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's, your mind, and everything. So this is where we need to be doing here. We need to learn to wait and understand what he meant. Close it up. Today, as I was praying about tonight, um, I had a, a memory, a thought. A few years ago, I was climbing into the car with my dad, and there was a pillow on the seat, and I went to move it. And uh, he said, you know what that is? I said, oh, it's a pillow. And he said, no, that's a reminder that God is there. I always make space for him. 
And a couple weeks later, I was back in Louisiana, and I had to drive to a pre-op appointment, which was about a four-hour drive one way. And I ended up having to take um, the trip alone. And it was that trip that all, every bit of heartbreak that I was feeling just settled in. And I remember looking at the seat next to me, and my purse was there, and my snacks for the day, and I moved them onto the floor. And I said, God, I can't do this without you. I'm making space and I'm making room for you today. I need you to be here. I have never felt before or after the presence of God like I felt that day. As soon as I said those words, it was as if God had sat down right beside me. And he went with me the entire trip to Houston. He walked the hallways of the hospital with me and all the way back home. And I tell that story for this. We have to lay some things down. We have to lay some hurts down. We want revival, but guess what? If we're not whole, we can't help anybody that's coming in far more broken than we are. So we have to lay some things aside. So it is my hope today as we close that we'll take some time and we'll really look into our heart and say, God, what is it that you want me to let go of? What do I need to put aside to make some space for you? What do you want me to give up? What do you want me to stop thinking about? Where do you want my attention to be? God, I just want you. And I would hope that we would all just find a place to pray, a place to just talk to God and give him all of those things over to him. Oh, God, I thank you, God, for who you are. God, I thank you for your strength. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Everything. Everything. Lay it down. And when you get up, leave it there. Leave it all there. Oh, mighty Jesus, I thank you today. You know everything, oh, Lord Jesus. You know everything about us. You love us like no other. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm